Okay, here we go. Well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Kambali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, in excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from October 29 to November 8, 2020. Kambali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever before. So I am just thrilled to be here um, with our wonderful speaker, Kutika Varugar. <laughs> Sorry, I practiced saying your name over and over, but I knew I would butcher it. Um, there's too many rolled R's there. And her wonderful new book, the Call Inside the Global Saudi Religious Project. And oh, trying to hold it up on Zoom is a challenge. Um, anyway, welcome, Kritika, and it's just such a pleasure to meet you. Um, yeah, although I hear we, actually, we actually met last year at Ubud, is that right? Yeah, we met briefly. Um, I want to say it must have been 2017. It was the only time I attended real Ubud festival in Bali. And I think we briefly met through our mutual friend, Andres Harsono. Um, of course, right. I read your book on tempo, but um, that goes without saying. Well, thank you. And I, I actually did not do uh, Kutika justice by her introduction. First of all, she is a young phenomenon. It's uh, I was looking over your bio today and realized that you graduated from high school in 2011. And the things that you have accomplished since then are absolutely astonishing. She then graduated from Harvard. She has a master's degree. Um, from the School of Oriental and African Studies, where she was a Fulbright scholar. She has worked as a reporter and editor um, all over the place. Um, she's written for The Guardian, The Financial Times, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New York Review of Books, Foreign Affair, The Economist, The New Republic, Foreign Policy. She's been on NPR. She's unbelievable. Um, and the amount of things that you have accomplished, you know, I think of you as you're, you're like the age of students that I had not that long ago, and what you have done is just remarkable. And this book is incredible. When, when I see that you started in Indonesia in 2016, and that you have produced this incredible book for uh, Columbia Global Reports, <laughs> how did you do, how did you, first of all, how did you pick Indonesia when you were at so, us, were, was, were you studying Indonesia? Because I saw you at, at Harvard, you majored in economics, English, and French. So how did you get interested in Southeast Asia anyway? So I went to SOAS after Indonesia. Um, I did my Fulbright year uh, while I was writing the book. So after I sold the book, I went there to research this and, and write the book there, which was good, I think, because I could kind of bring some experience to the table. I think it's hard to study, especially regionally like Southeast Asia, totally abstractly. So that was actually a really great experience. But, um, you know, I, I always wanted to write about the Islamic world. Um, I always wanted to be a journalist and foreign correspondent. But given the time that I grew up in, um, you know, in the post 9-11 era, I, the Islamic world was both the most um, covered in kind of a mysterious way subject in American news headlines and foreign affairs was the post 9-11 era. And then, right. you know, you get the war on terror and things like that. But it was also covered in a totally mystifying way, um, you know, repeating a lot of Orientalist tropes. It does make you want to learn more because some of the caricatures that are portrayed to American citizens and newsreaders about the Islamic world seem totally ridiculous. So obviously that was part of my interest. And I also wanted to see how religion and politics interacted in a modern country. Um, is of course a very religious country and very interested in religion in general and i wanted to also work in asia um because it's you know where most of the people in the world live and uh so between all, triangulating all of those things i had a hunch that indonesia would be a good place to um you know put my ear to the ground and see what was out there and start reporting some stories and and become a journalist and it very much exceeded my expectations as you know as you know it's very easy to fall in love with this country Absolutely. so um it also happened that the time i moved there um was a very exciting time within two weeks of my moving there the whole anti-ahop movement had started so it was actually an unusually restive time in indonesian politics so the questions i had about islamism religion and politics fundamentalism were immediately exploded into the you know national political stage so well, I stayed this makes it even more impressive then so you had not especially studied Indonesia until you landed there is that right 
No, I mean, I would say the most I knew about Indonesian foreign affairs was uh, the act of killing came out when I was in college. So I wow. learned about 1965 before I got there. But um, I think it was actually really great to experience me that way, because especially when you grow up kind of as an organization kid and kind of meritocratic America, you just learn things. And I'm also a nerd. So you just learn things from reading them. Reading is how I traveled since I was a child. So you have so many preconceived notions about a place. But part of the reason I think I was able to perceive so much more in Indonesia beyond the kind of privileged position of being a journalist is because I was really open to listening and taking notes and not coming in with too many right. frames. Um, and it's impossible. I can't think of anywhere else in the world at this point where I could really do that. So it was just kind of lucky. So were you freelancing then or were you working for somebody? How were you? Uh, yeah, I was always freelancing. I just bought a one-way plane ticket um, when I was 22 when I moved to Jakarta and figured things out. And then, you know, uh, there was a lot of stories to write. So I had a lot of work. And then, you know, the second time I went back after SOAS, I went as the Guardian's correspondent and also as a National Geographic explorer. But, uh, you know, never a dull moment. Well, this is, I mean, as somebody who's spent a lot of time now studying Indonesia and also kind of came in it accidentally as a Fulbrighter, I am totally impressed with this, that you, the way, the amount, that what you have mastered about Islam in Indonesia is astonishing. Um, for, see, I thought you were there 2016 to what, 2019. I didn't realize that that included the year that you were not even in the country. So this is, you know, I would really urge everyone to read this book. It is quite phenomenal. And I also love how you are kind of a model of a, of a of, you know, almost of a, of a 20th century adventuresome journalist that, that, that it's not really, it seems like these days it's very hard to have the, to create the kind of life that you have created. And it's just great. I mean, she's such an interesting person. I just, I have to ask you, where did you live in Jakarta? We made I lived a in a bunch of places. Uh, I lived in a bunch of places. My favorite place that I lived for the longest with a couple of my friends was in Menteng Dalam uh, in Tibet. Uh, beautiful compound, really traditional. They all close the street all the time to have these prayers. I've also lived in Setia Budi and in a high rise apartment in um, in Sudirman Park. So a little bit all wow. over the place. We were neighbors. I, I have an apartment in Puri Casablanca, which I haven't oh, been to yeah. since January, but. Uh... But anyway, so you and I, we are going to talk about your book, but I just want to place you again. So you're now back in the U.S. in, yeah. um, mm -hmm. in New York. Is that right? Or yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. I moved back in March, a month before my book came out. Um, I was going to come back in April, but obviously the pandemic sped things up. So luckily so you came back because of the pandemic. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. So now that we've gotten you situated here, um, your book is just amazing. And uh, again, the title is The Call Inside the Global Saudi Relation, Religious Project. I said Saudi Relations, which actually is kind of relevant too. I love how you use the word public diplomacy, what the uh, and kind of soft power, what the Saudis are doing. So, I mean, everybody, I'm sure everyone in this audience, whether you've been in Indonesia recently, are in Indonesia now, has heard Indonesians talk about Arabization which I gather was one of the first things you heard too when you arrived in Jakarta. When, when Indonesians or um, non-Indonesians in Indonesia talk about Arabization, what are, what are they talking about? Um, so yeah, as you said, and as I write in the book, Arabisasi was one of these discourses I heard very soon after I moved to Indonesia, especially because uh, you know the, the Islamic Defenders Front was kind of dominating headlines when I got there. It's this idea that Saudi Arabia had somehow corrupted or irrevocably changed or made very much more conservative the Islamic traditions of Indonesia, which is the world's um, largest Muslim majority country and home to the largest population of Muslims in the world. Um, there's an idea both inside and outside Indonesia that the kind of homegrown traditions of Islam Nusantara or archipelago Islam were much less uh, literalist and orthodox and and kind of um, and conservative, I guess, is this in broad strokes, than it became in recent years, especially after 1998, after the Suharto dictatorship collapsed. And because this conservative turn was so kind of extreme, given the somewhat 
uh, syncretist and animist traditions that existed before this, people did cast about for a reason um, why this seemed to happen. One of the popular reasons given was Arabisasi, because Saudi Arabia has been investing in Indonesia for five decades. Um, and there is a Saudi university in Jakarta and, you know, Arabic speaking scholars are very much looked up to in Indonesia. So there's always this idea that when something, you know, when one other domino falls, you know, when one other um, Islamist politician comes to the stage or when you see, you know, more and more women wearing hijabs or some other Sharia inspired bylaw in the books, this is all like Arabi Sasi, it's not Indonesian. I'm not saying these things are true. I'm just saying this is the discourse that exists and that I was looking into. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. you, you what you've described, um, is, is it true? Is it, I mean, is there something to this idea that, look, all these changes are really due to the Saudis? I mean, I've heard that too. Everybody says that. They say, it yeah, and, yeah. is it true? Are you, you're now the expert on this. Is uh, the, uh, the cutting right to the chase here, is, is, is there something to this? It's, it's definitely not true that all these conservative changes are due to Saudi influence that would just be attributing too much, I think, to one small Gulf country that's in fact very far away from Indonesia and taking some agency away from Indonesians who have their own indigenous conservative literalist and puritanical traditions dating back well before Saudi Arabia ever started working there. That being said, what I was surprised by and why I did write this book is that the range of Saudi influence has actually been much more vast in some ways than I even expected when I first started looking into this uh, in terms of the programmatic nature and how much personal effort they put into developing some of these relationships with people like Mohammed Natsir, who is the first prime minister of Indonesia. And the fact that they set up these um, offices under the religious attache as far away as Maluku and Papua and Aceh. The fact that there's a Saudi charity campaign office still in Banda Aceh, uh, which was set up after the tsunami. So it's like very much still in the 21st century. And the fact that this huge university um, uh, that is a branch of our university in Riyadh exists in South Jakarta and has graduated so many influential people to this day. Um, I think the nature and subtle nature and complex nature of this was a surprise to me. And I don't even think most Indonesians are aware of this range of effects. Right. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I've heard lots of people just talk about Friday prayers at the mosque and they feel that the, the sermon is, you know, much more focused now on topics that would be in keeping with this conservative turn that you've described, and they attribute it to Erbazasi. I mean, I, I hear that all the time on that level, but, but I think, but you're right, you, what you've managed to document in a really impressive way is both the history of and extent of this sort of network of, of, of what Saudi paid for institutions and and also the network of connections is, is quite interesting. Um, I, I know probably most of the people here are familiar with these terms, but it might be, if you wouldn't mind, it might be useful kind of running through a couple of the terms that you use in your book a lot, and I'm sure we will use today a lot, um, specifically dawa. I always say datwa, which is the Indonesian yeah, way. Yeah. Dawa, um, uh, Wahhabism, and uh, Salafism. What, what, what is the difference between a Salafi, a Wahhabi, and what is datwa? Yeah, so Dawa is um, the Arabic word that gives the title of my book. It means the call or invitation to Islam. And it basically just means, um, you know, Islam, like other monotheistic religions, is somewhat evangelical. And every Muslim has a duty to invite other to their faith. Um, and this could mean anything. It could mean just acting in a way that befits a good Muslim. It could also mean very direct evangelism and missionary activity. So Dawa, um, in the sense that I write about it, is the Saudi government and Saudi institutions sponsored missionary activity around the Muslim world. And it started in the 20th century because Saudi Arabia is a very young country, uh, only came together in 1932. Um, so Saudi Arabia now actually has a Dawa ministry that oversees a lot of these activities around the world. It's another reason that my book looks at kind of a global scope because the, because Saudi Arabia itself considers this dawa in a global setting. Um, An Indonesian word for it, of course, is dakwa. And that word is also found in one of the most important uh, Saudi dawa institutions in Indonesia, um, 
DDEE or Dewan Dakwa Islamia Indonesia, which was the organization founded by Mohammed Natsir that kind of funneled a lot of Saudi money into Indonesia and which still exists today in Chikini. Um, Wahhabism is the state religion of Saudi Arabia. It's named after this 18th century preacher, very austere fundamentalist guy, um, a little bit like Martin Luther in what he wanted to do to Islam, which is strip it of all these rituals that he thought were really unnecessary and bad, um, but also much more violent in practice than Martin Luther. So I don't want to take the comparison too far. <laughs> he was basically this austere desert preacher in the Arabian Peninsula who um, preached this doctrine based on takfir or excommunicating any Muslims that he felt were not, were straying far from the true path. And he was very against things like worshiping at tombs, um, celebrating the prophet's birthday, venerating saints, and so on. So he's a very literalist, austere preacher. And in, towards the end of the 18th century, he formed a pact with the Royal House of Saud, um, which was, you know, which has periodically controlled various parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and today is you know, still the ruling family of the modern Saudi state, but they formed this pact um, whereby he would provide religious legitimacy to them if he if they would protect his sect and his version of Islam. So that pact is held in some way up until this day. And you know, Saudi, the House of Saud is a is a Wahhabi family, and Wahhabism is the state religion. Um, I. What I try to emphasize that, you know, Wahhabi is often used as an insult in countries around the world, not least of which is Indonesia, definitely right. also in like American security circles. Um, it's really site specific. If you can't just call anyone a Wahhabi, it's really dependent on being in Saudi Arabia and having some kind of relationship, even if it's like a kind of citizens relationship to a monarchy. Um, of obedience to the House of Saud. So it doesn't really make sense for someone in Indonesia to be a Wahhabi unless they're a Saudi because they wouldn't have any relationship. That being said, when the Wahhabi Dawah went worldwide, what they did, what they did encourage was this other very, uh, you know, in practice, very similar movement called Salafism. And Salaf is an Arabic word that means the first um, four generations of Muslims closest to the prophet. So it's this movement to return back to the earliest Islam. It's also very literalist. It's also very discouraging of poly polytheistic practices like veneration of saints um, and tombs. So in practice, they end up having a lot of similar goals. But Salafism um, actually arose in Egypt in the 19th century in reaction to colonialism and has its own intellectual tradition. But because it's more of like an anti-colonial movement, it's explicitly transnational in nature. So it's easier for someone anywhere in the world to become a Salafi than to become a Wahhabi because Salafism is not site specific. Anyone can become a Salafi. The texts are right there for you. Um, so when we talk about what Saudi Arabia um, spread in Indonesia, it ended up fomenting Salafism and not Wahhabism per se. Right. I think this is such an important distinction. And if, um, you know, I, I hope that readers of your book do take that away, if nothing else, that it's just geographically wrong to say, oh, well, yeah, the Wahhabis are taking over Indonesia because it just doesn't even make sense, you know? Um, the, the Salafism is interesting. And um, I, I don't know if you know, I also wrote a book on journalism and Islam and I became very interested in, in the, 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 the effects of, of the, the Salafi movement in Indonesia and also in Malaysia and the, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and you know, their connection to, to uh, PKS and blah, blah, blah. So I, I think it's, I, I like how you sort of tease out that, you know, first of all, one, that, that one thing that one misconception is that, look, the Saudis didn't come here with a blank slate. There was already a considerable Salafi movement in Indonesia that had nothing to do with Saudi Arabia, and had, or, well, maybe not nothing to do, but had a, certainly not with Saudi outreach, but a lot mm -hmm. more to do just with this shared tradition of Salafism and the influence of Al-Azhar. Um, um, so that I, I found really interesting. Um, and you, you, and I should also say, uh, Kutika is not just right about Indonesia. She has wonderful chapters on Nigeria and Kosovo, but for the purposes of this, it might make more sense to in general talk about Indonesia. Um, why, what, what is, what is the appeal of Salafism? Why, you know, you're, you're a, you're a, you grow up in a nice Muslim family somewhere in central Java or in Lombok or what it, why? Why is it that you, what, what would you find so appealing in Salafism? 
Um, there's two things, and I would like to paraphrase a bit from, I, I'm guessing, our mutual friend, Ulil Abshar Abdallah, who is a you know, prominent liberal uh, Islamic intellectual in Indonesia and also studied at Lithia, the Saudi University, and was briefly uh, ensconced in the Salafi orbit. He said, first of all, it's very simple. They tell you what text to read and uh, what to believe, and it's very textual, and kind of the direct access is there, and it's the same corpus all around the world, so it makes you feel like you're part of this global community. He's from, uh, you know, a Javanese NU family with its own kind of distinct traditions, but a lot of those are oral traditions or kind of implied or handed down or very contextualized. And as Indonesia, you know, became a democracy and also became globalized and became part of the global media ecosystem, there is this anxiety in a lot of Indonesian Muslims that their traditions are just like really different for some reason from these other traditions in the Middle East that they're now being exposed to more and more because of uh, news media and so on. And you know, these kind of anxieties produced by globalization do kind of encourage people to, um, or it's, a, it's definitely a push factor towards um, the Salafi variant of Islam, which seems like more official or legit um, for some reason, especially because their texts are like in Arabic and their scholars are like right. world famous scholars and so on. And they're not just Indonesian scholars. Um, the other thing is that traditional Islams in, in Indonesia, but also in the other countries I wrote about are very hierarchical. And they, you know, rely a lot like the Kiais in Java, which are the learned Islamic scholars in Nigeria. It is, um, you know, the Sufi scholars who have hereditary authority. And it's not very democratic. Whereas Salafism is radically democratic. Anyone can become a Salafi and have exactly as much knowledge as the next person. And that also is very appealing to a wide variety of people. And I want to get back to the Saudis, but just for a minute for our friends who are, who are probably thinking more in the Indonesian context. Is this basically the difference between Muhammadiyah and NU that you have just described, Nadlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah, that, that one is more traditionalist, um, venerating the ancestors, the Kiais, and Santran, where Ar Arabic is a language, versus uh, Muhammadiyah, which is, is reformist, and meaning reformist going back to the tra traditions, forget, or the, to, the, to the, the Salafis and forgetting all these accretions. Is that... Is that basically the way to think about it in Indonesia, or is it? Is, is, does that not quite do it? It definitely, it definitely is a way to think about it. I think that's it's definitely right. Nu for all of its, you know, I think a lot of Western observers love Nu because it seems so like pluralist. And because of Gus Dur, we love him. You know, yeah, He's we the love Gus Dur. God doesn't good need defending. Yeah, but it is it is very hierarchical and it's very based on family relationships and traditions that are by nature exclusive. And you're right, Muhammadiyah is one of the reformist movements I cited as like pre-Saudi outreach. Uh, Persis is another good example of, of people that slowly try to chip away at this kind of traditional authority. That being said, I think I would technically still call Muhammadiyah a traditionalist organization because it's kind of homegrown and it's I wouldn't call it Salafi, but you're right that it's more skeptical of uh, authority figures than Enu, but you know, Muhammadiyah, of course, like, you know, we can't uh, have our images of these groups ossified. Muhammadiyah has been right. around long enough that it has right. its own, uh, you know, prominent families and so on. So I would say that it's also traditionalist, but, but it had that same energy when it first started. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things um, you you use an image, uh, I think a couple times in the book that's, that I found really interesting that that even though you call this the Saudi religious project, that there was a, it was a little bit haphazard. You use the image of throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. And I love yeah. that because if you want to explain how that works, um, again, in the context of Indonesia, what, what, what was the spaghetti they were throwing and, and kind of what stuck and what fell to the floor? Yeah, I mean, my goal with that image is just to, to like, shake off a little bit of this um, idea that it's like this dark money that's controlling the world. I think you can easily fall into conspiracy thinking when you talk about these, especially because Saudi seems like such a, you know, um, um, obscure and hard to understand monarchy, but they weren't like evil geniuses or anything. They were just doing their dawah through interpersonal relations. So they tried all kinds of things. They weren't even specifically aiming for certain goals. Once um, King Faisal opened the taps of Saudi money to Mohammed Natsir, Mohammed Natsir had a lot of autonomy to distribute money as he saw fit. And he tried to control things to a certain extent, but even he kind of like was pretty Catholic in what he funded. So he helped, for example, endow uh, Pondok Pesantren 
um, al mukmin in central Java, which later became this hotbed of jihadist activity. That was not a goal of Muhammad Nasir. He tried to distance himself. And that would himself. have been an N-U Pasantran, right? Originally, wasn't that um, connected to I, I, I don't think it was NU. It was definitely an NU territory in terms of what Solo is, but it was actually, you know, it was just like a local businessman who was um, um, uh, sympathetic to these aims who wanted to donate his land to this school. And um, Mohammed Nazir kind of handpicked some Salafi personnel from like um, Abu Nida, Chamsawa Safwan, and Abu Bakr Ba'ashir became like an intense jihadist and you know tried to endow this school. And it kind of sprawled out of his control pretty fast. Um, and then, you know, Lipia, the Saudi University was originally started as an Arabic language institute. It started in 1980, the year after the Iranian revolution, which was not a coincidence. And it slowly became, you know, it's, it definitely teaches Wahhabi theology, but then in the nineties, it started teaching Islamist theology more in like the Muslim brotherhood strain, like the Egyptian strain. So even Libya has had these ideological splits and evolutions right. over the years. Um, in Aceh, after the tsunami, a Saudi charity campaign certainly tried to do Wahhabi Dawah along with their tsunami relief, but um, Achenese people pushed back on it. Um, and so, you know, all, and then of course they gave us a wide variety of scholarships to many different people who's, um, and the alumni of these um, scholarships have ranged from someone like um, the leader of the Prosperous Justice Party, which is a very prominent uh, Islamist party in Indonesia, to Ulil Abshar Abdallah, who is a liberal Islamic theologian who completely rejected it, to Habib Razik Shahab, who started this kind of militia organization, um, to, you know, a whole variety of people. So even the products of these universities uh, is not a cut and dry thing. And I wanted to just... Right show that there's such a diverse range of outcomes from this project. Yeah, I, it's, it, it is, I'm, I'm glad you said that. It, it's not, as you say, it's not some kind of evil conspiracy, which I think sometimes foreigners say, say that, see that. But um, you also point out in your book, just the, the, the publication outreach, the translation mm -hmm. project, translating the Koran, making an updated version for in English, translating it in all these languages that, um, you know, that there was a concerted effort to translate and get texts out, including in Indonesia. That was a big thing. Um, and then later, you, you, you talk too about all of the, um, uh, what am I looking for? It's the philanthropic effort, some of which later turned out to be connected to terrorism. But that, again, doesn't seem to have been a big plot. It just the throwing spaghetti thing, like, oh, this is a good project. We'll give you money. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I tried to um, kind of um, overcorrect in some ways for some of the conspiracy things. But that being said, the one thing I do want to say is like, it's not an accident that Saudi Dawa has has overlap with jihadi activity in all the countries I wrote about. The theology is not just another kind of Islam. It is a very intolerant fundamentalist kind of Islam. So it's that's why a small fringe of these Saudi supported projects do always end up with the Salafi jihadist right. uh, variety. So that's where the Bali Arabia, bombers went to the school. As you point out, including in Saudi Arabia, that, yes, that yes. The, the kind of uneasy, uneasy partnership between the US and Saudi Arabia and fighting terrorism, including within Saudi Arabia is, you know, you, you yeah. address yeah. that too. That, that's one thing that is truly impressive about your book. The, this is, you know, the, it, this does not seem like a book that is written by someone in her twenties, but rather quite a senior scholar who has had time to assimilate a vast amount of material. So it's, again, it's just an amazing achievement. And it's readable too. I don't mean to make it sound like it's some Thank boring. you so much. I mean, just to the point, I mean, I, I did, I really just got lucky and benefited from studying it in an academic context while I was writing this book, because I think the trick, I think that as journalists, and you know, you're, you, you have overlap with the world journalism too, we tend to uh, prioritize empiricism and the anecdote and the well-chosen character. Um, but that's not like when you're talking about such a big phenomenon like this, you do have to hang it up on the scaffolding of research to me because I'm not discovering any of these things for the first time. So that's why it was so helpful to really be in like a library setting and a classroom setting a right. lot of the time while I was writing this. Um, and, that, and you're in the academy too, so you know what I'm talking about. Is like your scholarship is just like pushing 
um, the record a little bit, but it's not, I think in journalism, sometimes it feels like you're discovering everything for the first time ever. So I want to kind of come halfway between those things. And you did that great. And also the other thing that struck me is uh, I have always said that I love the Indonesian word kebetulan, uh, coincidence, that everything interesting that's ever happened to me happened completely by coincidence. And it yeah. sounds like in a way the same with you, that you came to Indonesia interested in Islam, sort of, and then you were there for the big aksi, um, the anti ahok axi, which seems to have sort of, you know, launched you on a really major endeavor. It's, it's quite impressive. Well, anyway, there's some other things I wanted to ask you about. One of the things, um, you know, it's not a secret, we're, we're both Americans and um, the relationship, the effect of the Cold War on all of this, I find really interesting, particular, particularly in relationship to Indonesia and um, what, uh, you want to just sort of briefly tell us about how did the Cold War affect the U.S.'s view of this whole Saudi Dawa endeavor? What did, what did, you know, what, what was that all about? I mean, yeah, I think in a broad stroke, the U.S. and Saudi were present buddies during the Cold War. Of course, the relationship goes back to the 1930s when oil was discovered and Aramco was the linchpin of this relationship. But the, the U.S.-Saudi relationship has never been closer than during Can the I, Cold War. I have War. to interrupt you really, really quick. I want to interrupt you. My mother worked for Aramco in the 1950s. <gasps> yes. In she Saudi? Worked, she worked no, no. Well, she well, her dream was to go to Saudi, but she didn't. She married my dad instead and had me. But she worked for the. She was the executive secretary for the head of the aviation division, George Krager, and she her dream was to go to Saudi Arabia. But so I loved, I loved your whole thing about the sort of the role of Aramco and kind of popularizing and kind of softening Saudi Islam for Americans, including this great thing where you say that it. Well, it's really kind of like Unitarianism. That's how to look at it. Yeah. So um, I, I well, just a tan the, well, just a tangent that you might be interested in as a media scholar. Um, have you ever read Aramco World Magazine? No, no. Oh my God. So it's free. It's online. I'll send you a link. It's like one of my favorite magazines in the world. It's put, put out by Aramco and it's like covers like the Islamic world in the most uh, wonderful, unique way. Like it's beautiful photographs, like, you know, Sulawesi to like Uzbekistan. It's like really oh, the wow. whole Islamic world is their mandate. And it's been coming, I don't know how they, it's a very small operation apparently. They have some kind of amazing roster of writers and just like the best content. Um, I really encourage you to look it up. It's one of my oh, favorites. You need to like, write an Aramco. article about Aramco. That would be really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you know a lot about it. And and this is something that we just don't know enough about. Anyway, yeah. back to the Cold okay. War. Sorry, Cold War. So yeah, you know, our relationship started you know, a long time ago, FDR famously met with the Saudi king on Bitter Lake uh, uh, during World War II. Um, but during the Cold War, we had very similar aims. America, of course, uh, was very, very anti-communist in an active way around the world in many world theaters. Cold War was very hot in Asia and Africa. And Saudi was also anti-communist for its own reasons uh, because uh, popular revolutions of all kinds were sweeping through the Islamic world. There was uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt, um, the Iranian revolution in 1979. So there was Arab socialism on one hand and then this kind of Shia revolutionary activity on the other hand. All of these movements were very threatening to Saudi, which is an absolute Sunni monarchy. So they really wanted to um, project their image as the leader of the Islamic world, um, which is not so far-fetched because Islam did start in Saudi Arabia. They do have that claim. They're the custodian of the two holiest mosques in Islam. Um, but they wanted to project their authority against these kinds of revolutionary currents. So it ended up that Saudi and America had a lot of elective affinities. And they worked together a lot, especially in Africa, in this kind of wacky alliance called the Safari Club, um, fighting back anti-communist -commun movements all across Asia, uh, Africa, like in, uh, in Somalia and the Horn of Africa, for example. Um, the peak of their Cold War uh, cooperation was in Afghanistan, the Soviet-Afghan War, when um, Saudi and America each contributed about $3 billion to arm the Mujahideen rebels against um, Soviet-backed forces. That was the peak of our cooperation. And the Afghan theater actually um, created some of the most violent jihadists around the world who went home after that, including to Indonesia, where they fomented jihadist activity there. So there's all this like contracting and going back out, contracting activity that was fomented by the Afghan war. And the U.S.-Saudi relationship was really crucial to that because I don't know that Saudi would have necessarily um, 
you know, put so much money in Afghanistan, which is famously the graveyard of empires, had America not encouraged it so much. Um, it's just funny to think about this relationship, which we've mostly forgot, forgotten about in the American psyche now, because America really did a 180 after 9-11 and declared this war on terror. But in the 70s and 80s, they were very supportive of Saudi Dawah specifically, they thought Islam would be a deterrent to communism. So our, our own position as a country has done so much whiplash that people need right. to know about. And so has Indonesia. This is, um, you, you make somewhat passing reference to the, uh, the 1955 conference in Bandung, where Sukarno and Nasser were talking about kind of Islamic socialism. And remember, Sukarno, um, well, his, his his sort of final platform was a uh, was Nasakam, what um, religion, uh, nationalism, and communism, um, and and that that this um, was not popular with the United States, to put it mildly. That that uh, it's pretty clear the United States supported the overthrow of Sukarno and the installation of Suharto, and so part of it was to get rid of this idea of the sort of socialist Islam and the Saudis stepped right in with a very nice alternative anti-communist version that fit real well in the Cold War. So I, I think that's a really important connection. But um, one thing that I, um, it, it's interesting, I'm, I'm fascinated by your work, but also by the kind of chronology of when you did research and when I did research, because I was, um, for my book on journalism and Islam, you were probably in elementary school then, but <laughs> I think you were actually at Harvard. But so I sort of stopped my research around 2016. And so, oh, okay. um, and I looked at different news organizations, including Tempo, including, um, including Republica and Sabili, um, which is now, uh, which went out of business in 2013. But I actually found in all three publications a, a fair bit of pushback to kind of Saudi view of things. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe some of this has changed. Um, one of the things in, and even Suharto that, uh, I, you know, again, I'm a couple generations ahead of you in terms of scholarship, but, you know, the, the, in, the incident that influenced us was the resignation of Suharto and the idea that before that he had helped, you know, he, he saw two threats to Indonesia from the left, which would be communism and from the right, which would be Islam political Islam. So he really put the brakes on political Islam, as you know, including through created through his minister of religion, Mukti Ali, and creating the whole Islamic University and Institute network, which was designed to, to promote kind of interfaith dialogue and the scientific study of religion. So there was this sort of, you know, that, that in some ways it was actually Suharto that helped keep a lot of this at bay, right? Is that, would you totally. agree with that? And then, then you know, yeah, the, yeah. Oh, Suharto kind of, wow, it's a, Sabili comes back, they do whatever they want, and there's a whole new fresh playing field here. Is that, is that, does yeah. that make sense? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, like anyone who studies in New I wish I could have a time turner and go back and be there in 1988, but, you know, just have the received wisdom. But that, you know, the explosion of the democratic public sphere in 98, which unleashed some of these uh, conservative currents that have been building underneath the political discourse level for some time is really, really significant. And it's part of why I don't like the evil genius narrative of Saudi. Like absolutely the Saudi influence was growing all throughout the Suharto years. And it was kind of hidden because these people were not in politics at the time, but the explosion- That was illegal. Of, you couldn't be doing that. It was- Right, right. Well, famously Mohammed Natsir, who was shut out of government uh, when when, um, when Suharto came to power said, we, we, no, we no longer can, use politics for our preaching, so we'll use preaching to do our politics. So he did this explicitly anti-political turn that's very significant to the growth of Saudi ideas in Indonesia during the Suharto years. But, you know, it was one of many things that were building up during that time. Of course, the Suharto years also artificially suppressed Islamic piety right. of all kinds, not just Salafis, just like being a regular Muslim was a little bit discouraged in the public sphere. Um, for a, lot, a long time, women couldn't even wear hijabs in public office and things like that. I mean, he loosened up on that a little bit towards the end, but it was very much a secular-minded government. And when the authoritarian regime fell, a whole bunch of not just conservative, but also just religious currents were unleashed in the public sphere. That's why FPI was founded right after that. Um, 
And, you know, that's why all these new radio stations and magazines were founded. And they all contributed to the conservative turn. It wasn't just Saudi. Um, but I also want to touch on what you said about magazines and publications pushing back on Saudi ideas. Absolutely. I mean, that, you know, I think I tried to portray this a little bit. Of course, Indonesians, like any country, aren't going to take this lying down. It wasn't universally popular, this ideology, and it still is not today. It's not like they were being brainwashed. A lot of people had their own reasons for being drawn to this ideology. Part of it was the uh, anti-religious Suharto regime. Part of it was the educational opportunities of going to college for free, even if it was at Lipia, that that Ulil Abtar Abdallah has talked about. So it's a developing country, right? It's kind of hard to say no to a full scholarship that they'll pay for you to go to college. Right. I don't want to discount people's economic motives there. Um, so yeah, and there, there was always pushback from mainstream figures. The issue with the pushback, in my mind, is that the, no one has ever really been able to articulate what Islam Nusantara, so to speak, is, or what do they stand for positively that's not this intolerant version of Islam. And I actually think that's still a challenge today. Um, I think yeah. that NU has found it really hard to articulate a positive version of what they claim is non-Salafi traditionalist Islam. Because the problem is some of them are conservative too. A lot of them are anti-Shia, even if oh, they're right, NU. right. That's something I, I would like us to talk about, but, and I, I agree with you that right now, Islam Nusantara is kind of an empty term, um, but there has been this pushback tradition, and particularly in Tempo. Um, and as you know, it was Tempo that popularized the ideas of Nuhulish Majid and uh, mm -hmm. renewal and Islamic yeah. thinking, which I would say actually is the roots of what people who don't really know the history would call Islam Nusantara, um, that that for, and it may have been that for the generation before the one when you came to Indonesia, there was always a sense that look, if there's going to be renewal in Islam, it's going to come from Indonesia. That Indonesia has produced these tremendous scholars that the rest of the world just doesn't know, and the Polish Majid being one of them, and yeah. the EIEN UIN tradition, Azumar di Asri, that there has been this alternative tradition in Indonesia. Um, the jotting on Islam liberal, Ulil, you know, that there, there has been this sort of countercurrent to Salafism. And, and, and a lot of it has been in media. Um, um, you mentioned media, uh, Day, 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 and they, their famous publication, Media Datwa, which of course hates tempo, just as Sabili hated tempo. You know, there was, a, I think there's been a struggle within media Absolutely. for a long time over the future of Islam in Indonesia. And I guess the only thing I, I love your book, but the only thing I would push back on a little bit is that I think there has been, and you do say this, and, but, and yeah, you can't write about everything, but I don't think that Indonesians have exactly taken this lying down like, yes, please come and you know, help us. Although you're right, the scholarship money, the opportunity for further study, you know, I think that that's, you know, that's a real thing. And, and you know, who wouldn't take advantage of it? It's kind yeah, of like- Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, one thing I would love to understand better, and I have not come to a satisfactory understanding of, is why this promising reformist currents of Ajumari Arda, Nushalis Majid, and so on, they kind of fizzled out before they reached their full promise. And I actually, I'm sure there's scholarship on this that I could keep reading about. I think by the time I got there, the promise had been somewhat diminished because they didn't um, for some reason, they, they lost the public sphere battle for now. It might not be forever, but I definitely think in the years I was there, those kinds of performance intellectuals didn't have as much currency in, in mainstream, um, you know, debates around religion. And right. I'm not sure what the roots of that, maybe it was because this kind of uh, Islamist populist revival had snowballed so much in the time I was there that it kind of drowned them out. But that might be uh, it might be a pendulum swinging kind of thing. And that's why it's really interesting, the periods of our field work, so to speak. Right. I think when you were there, it was more optimistic that these people's yes. ideas would catch on. Um, and to me as well, I've studied them in an academic setting and it, it's a little bit of a mystery to be unraveled to me. Right. Um, and maybe it will swing back. Right, well, I would also suggest that maybe it's connected to media and to the decline of traditional media, mainstream media everywhere, including in Indonesia, that when I, I basically stopped my field work about the time you started and um, Tempo was still pretty strong, print media was still pretty strong, Republica was still pretty strong, they presented alternatives. 
And now um, all print media are struggling. They've not really made, yeah. I'm all due for, I, forgive me friends, but they have not made done a good job of trans, uh, you know, of, of dealing with the new media landscape. And yeah. um, as you pointed out in, in several places, and I heard you in another interview say, yes, the, the, um, the Saudis have been really effective at taking advantage of new media. They're right on top of things. And um, this internet savvy younger generation, they're not reading tempo. You know, they're looking at, at, at these online sites that, and getting information. From yeah, them. yeah. They, I mean, famously like country of netizens, right? They're like such big online users. So the imperative is really on them. But, you know, it's not an Indonesia specific problem. Obviously, in our own country, traditional media struggles to keep up with all kinds of fake news. In Nigeria, exactly. I wrote about how um, the Sufi scholars were really, really, and to this day are really reluctant to even go on the internet. Like they hate the internet. They hate new media. They really want to yeah. preserve their traditional authority. And Salafis have no, none of these compunctions. They're like, oh, cassette tapes, sure. Like videos, sure. TV, sure. Tweets, sure. Like we'll do all of it. Um, so they have this flexibility in many different theaters that allows them to reach more people where they're at. Right, right. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I several people said, why are you writing about Sabili? They're not even in business anymore. Well, yeah. they were the voice of scripturalist Islam yeah. for a long time in Indonesia, and they were really important. But now, you know, they don't exist. Um, all of their people now have various websites and do various things. So their ideas are still out there, but they're not actually in a, um, a, a print uh, forum anymore. One thing I am curious about, I, um, I, I, was, also, I was also fascinated by the concept of Dawa. Um, and in my research, it, um, I actually felt that I was the object of a lot of Dawa, that people, by taking the time I'm sure you've heard this too, that, that even if you only know one verse from the Quran, you have an obligation to share it. And I found people were so kind to me and would, you know, during Ramadan, they were fasting, whatever, they would take time to explain things to me. Um, and I actually, you know, even people with, people who I knew would profoundly disagree with me. You know, I'm a white, non-Muslim, American, secular, liberal, what, you know, but they would talk to me about things. Did you experience that too? Did you, did, did, how, how about you and Datwa personally during all of this field work, not only in Indonesia, but in all these countries? So I would say it was very uh, site specific for me. I think uh, I, it's a working hypothesis. I think I get less Dawa in Indonesia because they can contextualize me. My parents from India and I'm they're Hindu. I'm not really religious, but in terms of Indonesia, I find it easy to say that's what I am if they, if they ask Agama Appa. Or um, so I think because it, it fits into the Pantrasila framework, what they think my identity is, I get a little bit less active Dawa. Although every single person I've ever met, in almost every single person I've ever met, has been very open in explaining their traditions to me and including me, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think I've been a little bit less cross to in Indonesia, even by Salafis, they're kind of like, oh, like you have this other Pantrasila identity. We don't really feel the need to dawa you. Um, in Nigeria, I would definitely say I was experiencing a lot of dawa from all sides. Sufis definitely tried to bring me in. Um, and Salafis too, I debated a lot with them and they were like, Give, you know, you should read these books, think you're gonna come over to our side, just some food for thought. And then in Kosovo, I was never really subject of Dawa at all. So it really changed for me. And I think uh, that was really interesting to see different kinds of Salafis around the world. But I would say in Indonesia, I very rarely got the the full court press. Well, I never did either, actually. But I I felt that that people who would, you know how um, the, the, the um, absolutely wonderful quote, um, a, a journalist is always selling someone out, you know, People yeah, yeah. will talk to you even when they know it's not in their best interest to talk to you. And mm -hmm. and I felt like often why they were doing that um, was Dawa, that they felt they have an obligation to share what they believe, even if they know that I am not likely to believe it. And in fact, may end up writing something about it that they won't like, that it was still, and, and I was quite humbled. I was both touched by that and humbled by that. And you know, was impressed with the, the power of people's faith that it's like, I'm going to share with you, even though it's probably not in my best interest to do so. But I particularly found that at Sabili, you know, like, why would they even bother to talk to me? Because it was hard, hard to believe I was going to write anything really positive and, you know, 
congratulatory about Sabili. Did, so did you, did you yeah. have that sense ever? I no, mean, it's a mystery yeah. every day of my, it's a mystery every day of my life why anyone talks to me about anything. It's like the, it's like the tightrope of journalism, if you really think about it. Cause I, you know, when you're a journalist, you're like, I would never talk to a journalist. Um, but it's the miracle that makes our lives possible. I think, I think people do want to be heard. And I, I, I have to say, I don't, I don't think my, you know, even when I was talking about Salafis, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit value neutral in my approach. And I think I tried to make it clear that I wanted to get the correct, accurate picture out, which is true, I did. And I think there was a desire in many sectors, including the Saudi ambassador, the Saudi attache, um, to talk to someone for that purpose, because I don't think my book is an attack on even the Saudi campaign in any way. It's actually kind of want to put the facts out there and let people form their own opinion. So I think that mission does resonate with people who might not, um, you know, maybe right. want to talk to media otherwise. But I would say, I mean, with you, and if I really think about it, there's a lot of suspension of disbelief. Well, why does anyone talk to a journalist ever? Who knows? <laughs> I know. I went, I'm, uh, my, my friend Jay Rosen one time said, the best way to understand journalism is to have it done to you. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I now fear as, the that day. Of, as the author of a book, you have had journalism done to you a couple of times. Um, one of the um, one of the themes we've we, you and I've touched on a little bit, and you definitely touched on in the. Uh, I, I listened to your interview, your wonderful interview with the New York Southeast Asian Network. Margaret Squad, of course, is is brilliant. Um, but um, Coming back to this idea that a lot of people who study Indonesia kind of romanticize Enu and are critical of Muhammadiyah, of course, are critical of the the the, the Saudi influence, but um, that you actually see a, a, you see a, a lot more similarities in the lack of tolerance toward Shia, toward Ahmadiyya, um, certainly toward um, LGBTQ, blah blah blah. That there's that there may be less and less of a distinction between these groups in terms of how they, in terms of how they deal with minorities. And uh, certainly our friend Andreas Harsono, I can hear him going, yes, yes, time to bring this up. Is that, um, what, what, what about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a soft orientalism or maybe wishful thinking sometimes where we're Western, Western scholars are just, a, I think there is a fundamental discomfort with the fact that Indonesia has become more and more religious by the day as it became more and more democratic. And it's fully both, it's fully religious and fully democratic. And it just goes against kind of our secularization theory of foreign relations and so on. But that is the fundamental fact in Indonesia. Anyone who spent time there will realize it's not an oxymoron. And there is still, there's still a Western trope that I had to actively unlearn while I was there, that something becoming more religious doesn't mean it's becoming worse or even more conservative necessarily. It's kind of just a thing that happens. So I think things get projected onto NU that are not true, frankly. And it's not, it is traditionalist. It's, it's quite tolerant within we know within the Indonesian tradition of being tolerant of other religions because it's always been a multi-faith country, but it's not progressive. And NU is not progressive. There's no traditionalist Islamic organization in Indonesia that's progressive. NU members marched in the Aksi Damai under Habib Rizik with their flags for a while until the leadership said anything. They are all anti-Shia, uh, which is a persecuted minority in Indonesia. None of them will stand up for the Ahmadiyya who have been driven into refugee right. camps. And increasingly many Indonesians don't even really want churches built in, in kind of Islamic majority neighborhoods, which Andreas has written a lot about in Human Rights Watch. So I, I don't want to uh, use too much relativism here. I definitely think these organizations are more tolerant than any Salafi for sure because Salafis are very, very extreme and literalist. Um, but in terms of the effects, right, that what are the effects of Salafism? It's intolerance, um, it's more literalism, maybe a little bit less room for women in public life because Salafis traditionally are against women working and so on. Those effects are a little bit hard for me to separate. And I don't think NU yet has articulated a positive vision of like supporting minorities actively. And no one in Indonesia really has. It's been like this race to the bottom. So I feel like the Salafi um, discourse has shifted the Overton window in kind of a bad way where like everyone's like, oh, 
we don't really like Shia. Like, who's standing up for Shia in Indonesia today? I don't really know. Right. It's like such a weird minority. Right. It's like a very progressive position. So that's just the thing I want to hammer down on is that even if Salafis are intolerant and they've they've really contributed to this like rise in intolerance in Indonesia, a lot of people have gone along with that. And that's just right. what I want to yeah. make clear in the book. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a political scientist whose work you probably know, uh, Jeremy Menchik, who wrote a book on mm -hmm. uh, what he called Tolerance Without Liberalism. And, yeah. and, and, and he talks about what he describes as godly nationalism in Indonesia, where you can, you can tolerate the Ahmadiyya, meaning you tolerate their right to exist, but you still think they're deviant and not Muslims. Yeah. And yeah. that that is jarring to the, my way of thinking but it's not jarring to the Indonesian way of thinking. So people can say, yes, of course we tolerate this. We're not gonna burn their community. And you can be critical of burning the community, but that doesn't mean that you say, they have a right to call themselves Muslims just as much as you and I do. That, that's a, that's a, that is a liberal approach, which I don't think anybody, well, Ulil had that. I mean, he, I remember he specifically yeah. said to me, I, I believe the Ahmadiyya are Muslims. They call themselves mm -hmm. Muslims. They can be Muslims, but yeah. that's not something you're going to find <laughs> widespread in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Wendy Brown, uh, one of our great political theorists, America said, you only tolerate that which you cannot do anything about. So it's this really big grudging feeling of tolerance, right. I think. Right. Uh, I hate that word. Anytime anybody says, I, I tolerate you, that always means I, I don't really like you and I think you're wrong, but sure, I'm, you, know, you, yeah. you have a right to exist. Well, yeah. um, this has just been such a great pleasure. You're wonderful to talk to. And I um, would really urge everyone to have a look at this book, which I'm not doing a very good job. Well, I can't <laughs> even hold it up. It is The Call, Inside Thank the Global you. Saudi Religious Project. Anybody who loves Indonesia will find it fascinating. And um, also anybody who's interested in Kosovo or Nigeria, which we haven't even talked about. That's fantastic. You do a wonderful job drawing all these parallels and, and distinctions. And the rest of your work, I would also urge you to look at Kritika's um, website because she's got links to all of these great stories many of which are about indonesia timor Leste, you know wonderful stuff and I, I i said it to you in an email i've been reading your work for a long time before i even knew you so she's the real deal and um you know i'm just super grateful um i also hope that uh i'd love to have you write something on um aramco because i think that they you know because you've got all this other background and it there's i know there's company. yeah I know. Yeah, I, there's yeah. a lot more to say on the U.S.-Saudi relationship. That was something that became obvious to me as something of unending fascination. So, you know, fingers crossed that there's more to come. So what actually are you going to do next? I, it's, I think we have like one or two minutes left. What, what actually are you working on now? What's your next project? Uh... Um, well, I, I'm back in the spring and uh, I've been working a lot on racial justice and policing in America, obviously, pretty soon after my um, book came out and wrapped up, um, George Floyd was murdered over here and that kind of became, I was kind of open, again, as, as open as, as I was in Indonesia, I was open to reporting on whatever seemed to be pressing in America because I did want to, do want to live here going forward. Not that I have a choice because we're not allowed to go anywhere now because America right, are right. the of the world. Are you going back to, will you write more about Indonesia, you think? Or? I do need to go back to finish my, uh, my, my Wallace, uh, exploration project into bird poaching in the Malukas, which I had to kind of suspend halfway through because of the coronavirus, because we couldn't really travel in the East anymore. But I'm working with a wonderful Indonesian photographer there, Muhammad Fadli, um, on this uh, this big exciting project with these beautiful birds that are being trafficked oh, in Eastern Indonesia. I um, love the Malay archipelago. I mean, I, I feel like he he said stuff that nobody has ever, it, nobody's ever matched the mastery of that book. Plus just this the kind of marvelous arrogance about his ability to see and understand everything. It's a fantastic he's book. He's so too. great. He's like everywhere you want to go in Indonesia, he's written a little bit about it. And also Singapore and so on. Like right. I was in Sulawesi at one point and I just like, what did Wallace have to say about this? He's like, oh, I hung out with these bookies people. I went to these caves, these karst caves. And that's exactly what I did there too. Right, right. So he kind of, he's kind of like a field guy. Right? And I think his analysis of Timor-Leste has not been equaled. He, he observed things about Timor-Leste that 
you know, the Indonesians weren't writing about, the Portuguese weren't writing about, and I don't think the Timor government cares a whole lot about, but he was just spot on, you know. Anyway, well, I think our time is out, and thank yeah. you so much. Thank Everyone, you. I Thanks, you Janet. It's such a great follow her work. It's, she's, she's the real deal. I mean, you're like the new Martha Gellhorn minus Ernest Hemingway. I mean, <laughs> really, really great. And so, yeah. Thank you so much, Janet. Okay, now I have to read the closing. So, okay. Kambali 20 was made possible with the support of the Yaya San Mudraswari Sarawasti program, patron program, and their donors. The patron program was created to seek assistance for the survival of both festivals and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the Yaya San patron program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross-cultural platform of words, ideas, culture, and the creative arts. We urge you to follow the Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit the UbudWritersFestival.com for more information about the patron program. Yes, indeed, support this fabulous festival, and I certainly hope to see you all, including Kritika in uh, Ubud next year. So thank you so much. Yes, hopefully we can, we're allowed back in the country by then. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dima. Thank you, thank you Janet. Have a great Thank day. You. you too.